Welcome. We're glad to have you join us today. Welcome. Thanks for joining us to learn more about and go deeper with the evidence-based practices in the Mass Literacy Guide. I'm Donna Goldstein, an ELA Literacy Content Lead here at DESE. We appreciate your joining us. Mass Literacy Getting Started is a six-part series to support users in accessing specific areas of the Mass Literacy Guide. Today is our fourth session. Each session features experienced educators speaking directly to their use of evidence-based practices and connecting this work to the Mass Literacy Guide. Today's focus area is around language comprehension. The remaining two focus areas include students experiencing reading difficulties and leading a multi-tiered system of support. First, we have a few clarifications and reminders. Several participants have asked about PDPs for these sessions. We do not give PDPs. However, tomorrow you will receive email confirmation of your attendance for each 45 minute webinar that you have attended. Also, here's a screenshot of the link sheet. It's a central doc with registration for the upcoming sessions and all of the resources being shown today. They're all listed on this sheet. It's being dropped in the chat for you right now. As you know, this session is being recorded. You can find today's recording within a week or so on the Mass Literacy Guide landing page under the top resources section. The recordings of all prior Mass Literacy Guide webinars are there as well. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature. We will be monitoring that and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Remember, a page with a sequential list of all the resource titles and links referenced in today's presentation, including the top resources section where the video will be posted, was just dropped in the chat. This page also includes all of the links our featured speakers will reference today. Today we're going to start with a brief introduction and overview of our focus area, while most of the time will be for our featured speakers. Victoria Thompson and Mandy Hollister. After Victoria and Mandy present, we will have some question and answer time, which will be moderated by my DESE colleague, Catherine Tarka. Catherine is, is the Director for Literacy and Humanities at the department. So for those of you who are new to the Mass Literacy Guide, it is a statewide effort to empower teachers, I'm sorry, educators, with the evidence-based practices for literacy that all students need. Evidence-based instruction provided within schools and classrooms that are culturally responsive and sustaining will put our youngest students on a path toward literacy for life. As part of this work, over the next several years, DESE will offer early literacy programming paired with implementation supports, including resources, professional development, and grants. This is a screenshot of the Mass Literacy Guide landing page. We have a great video, and that features classroom teachers, specialists, and a couple of researchers who advised on the work. Lots of voices, perspectives, and areas of expertise contributed. The featured speakers in this video were among the 100 plus stakeholders who advised. We engaged with research advisors from across the country and even internationally, along with Massachusetts preschool and elementary teachers, administrators, and educator preparation faculty. DESE also partnered with the Massachusetts Reading Association and collaborated with the Mass Association of School Administrators, specifically working with a group of assistant superintendents. You can see the Mass Reading Association, Association logo at the bottom right of the landing page. In terms of setup, the Mass Literacy Guide is made up of five primary sections that are all accessible via this landing page. The sections include components of the core literacy block, skills for early reading, students experiencing reading difficulties, leading a multi-tiered system of support, 
in Pathway to Equity in Early Literacy. As mentioned during the welcome, the focus for today's section is language comprehension. Information and resources supporting the development of language comprehension are included in many areas throughout the guide. But today we will be making connections specifically here at the Skills for Early Reading section. Our featured speakers, Victoria Thompson and Mandy Hollister, both from Boston Public Schools, will be sharing their experience with evidence-based instruction to support language comprehension in just a few minutes. The resources and information they will speak to are all connected to this Skills for Early Reading section. Here is the Skills for Early Reading landing page. This section identifies the skills that contribute to early reading proficiency and, as those of you who have been joining us each week know, this is organized around the simple view of reading. The simple view of reading is a cognitively based theory that asserts that to learn to read, children must develop both fluent word reading and language comprehension. These two factors, fluent word reading and language comprehension, account for the variance in reading ability in young children. And this theory has held up in many studies over many years. As you might remember, if you joined us last week, our featured speaker, Jen Hogan, focused us on fluent word reading. And that speaks over here to this orange section, the fluent word reading side of the simple view. Today, the practices to support language comprehension that Victoria and Mandy will discuss are all within this blue side of the graphic, the language comprehension side, and include vocabulary and morphology, knowledge, syntax and grammar, and higher level language skills. So with all of this context in mind, let's get ready to meet today's featured speakers. We're really pleased to have Victoria Thompson and Mandy Hollister here to share about their evidence-based practice supporting language comprehension. Victoria is the principal at UP Academy Holland in Boston, and Mandy is an ESL teacher and coach there. Prior to her principalship at, principalship at UP Holland, Victoria was the Dean of Curriculum and Instruction and also an ESL teacher. She has served as a Teach Plus Fellow and also a Curate Fellow, facilitating the K-2 ELA panel on the Massachusetts Curate Project. Mandy has been teaching English learners in Boston for 15 years and has also taught English as a foreign language in Spain and Los Angeles. In the past five years or so, Mandy has been teaching about the science of reading and implementing those practices as an EL ESL coach and teacher. They both have much to share with us today and we appreciate their time and their expertise. After Victoria and Mandy present, we will have some question and answer time with them. So with that, Victoria, I am going to stop sharing my screen and invite you and Mandy to share your screen. And like I said, on the other side, we will have some Q&A. Welcome. Thank you so much, Donna. I'm just gonna get us set up here by sharing my screen. Awesome. So we are so excited to be talking about our experience with the Mass Literacy Guide and how it has helped us implement the research-based practices into our school, into our instruction, and into our programming. First, we're gonna ground ourselves in the very thing that brought us to love the Mass Literacy Guide in the first place, which is what Donna already alluded or talked about earlier, which is the simple view of reading. The simple view of reading, as we know, is the idea that fluent word reading multiplied by language comprehension equals reading comprehension. And the best way to think about this and what really clicked for me was the formula itself because it's a multiplication sign. And so one times zero equals zero. So if you don't have flu fluent word reading um, and you have language comprehension, you won't get reading comprehension. Um, one does not exist without the other. They work really together, um, hand in hand. And we wanna start here because although we'll be zooming in on the language comprehension piece today, we want to emphasize that just that alone will not support full reading comprehension and 
they really work together. Now for a bit about our journeys into the science of reading and the simple view of reading. And again, what really brought us um, to really use and love the Mass Literacy Guide. Starting with myself. So the thing that really stuck out to me to share as the starting point was this podcast at A Loss for Words. Mandy and I still talk about when we first listened to this podcast and how much it changed our, our thinking about reading. And what struck me personally was the flaws in the queuing system, how we were essentially teaching our students to guess words instead of giving them the phonics knowledge they needed to be able to decode. And so many times I used this as a teacher. I really relied on it truthfully. And um, looking back on that and then listening to this podcast was a huge aha for me. It of course made me question um, how I was leading the school at the time and then also how I taught. Uh, my English language learners. It was a turning point that led to many other things. We're going to talk about those on the next slide. Um, but first, um, let's hear from Mandy about her journey as well. Sure. So for me, my journey pretty much also began around the same time that this Emily Hanford um, podcast and blog came out. Um, at the time, I had been kind of like uncertain if the way that I was teaching was actually the best way to teach. And as an ESL teacher, I was looking, I was searching for ways to include my level one and two EL students in our grade level um, complex text. And in my search, I came across the Emily Hanford podcast and some a couple other blogs that really pointed me in the direction of science of reading. And it was just like, such as it's the same thing for Victoria, like just an aha moment of like, how could I have gone through all of my years of teaching and all of my years of um, university without knowing actually how we begin to learn to read. And then also like, I have a five-year-old daughter and at the time, a few years ago, I was also searching with how do I teach her how to read? I worked mostly with fourth grade students who were already, um, already knew how to read. And so I did my own research to learn how to teach her. And finally, I, through my, all of my searching, I had like joined the Facebook group, um, which is called Science of Reading, what I should have learned in college. And that he had a huge impact on me and um, pointed me to so many great resources. So we talked a little bit about the jumpstart to our journey um, and our kind of obsession with this, but there are so many more layers to this that have unfolded and are truly ongoing for us um, and also with the help of the Mass Literacy Guide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about more of our journey and the, all the different layers that go into it. So um, my experience with Curate and facilitating the K-2 ELA panel really opened up my eyes to um, digging into curriculum in a way that uh, would take you know, our instruction to the next level. Relatedly, Ed reports, again, digging through, making sure that we were aligned with um, the science of reading, the simple view of reading, and all of the research-based practices that are available on the Mass Literacy Guide. Really, hallway conversations, I mean, I would get I get multiple times a day um, reading specialists at my school stopping me in the hallway, telling me what they read about, um, what PD they went to on the science of reading, um, what what article that they read, and then how they want to implement that in our in our programming and in our instruction. So some things that we've talked about in the hallway that have made changes are what assessments do we um, use for our students. Um, how do we approach our targeted reading instruction, our small group instruction? Um, similarly, you know, getting more uh, uh, formal ways to make changes at our school through focus groups, curriculum shift focus groups, again, resource sharing with each other, um, getting late night texts from Mandy about what she read and, and what we need to do at our school, really just spiraling um, in a good way. And I put colleagues on here because colleagues, what comes through in all of these, um, this really is the bread and butter. Everyone around me at my job um, are is really sharing all this stuff, um, the stuff that's available on the uh, in the Mass Literacy Guide, um, and it's fueling our practice to be better reading teachers for our kids. 
um, because at our school, and uh, we've heard this um, in multiple PDs, we really believe that teaching reading is rocket science. Um, and that is a belief that comes through and all the intricacies of all the research that we need to really owe ourselves and our kids to know and do better. Which brings us to um, the mass literacy guide because we see the mass literacy guide as working hand in hand with what we are doing. We knew at our school that we wanted to align ourselves with the research and this tool, um, this guide really helps us to do that. And that's exactly what we're going to share a little bit about today. We probably could go on forever, but we chose some stuff to review with you. So again, like we said, we use the Mass Literacy Guide as the beginning, middle, and end resource when making critical decisions about our programming. We really think of it as um, a helpful thought process for us. Uh, we know it provides us with evidence-based practices. We trust it, you know, and so we know that we want it to be a guiding light for our programming and our instruction at our school. And just to put it in a high level perspective, um, we thought it might be helpful to just talk a little bit about at a high level before we start getting into the, the nitty gritty details is that it cuts through two main pillars of our approach that we'll refer to today. The first one being curriculum at our school and how it intersects with that and how it helps our process with that. And then also content knowledge and really believing that that's at the core um, for teachers. So Mandy's gonna talk a little bit about more about what those mean. Sure. So uh, when Victoria's referring to curriculum, the Mass Literacy Guide really helped us to focus our search of curriculum. We knew that we, through this guide, we knew that we wanted to find a knowledge-based curriculum that offered our students authentic experiences. We did not want a curriculum that taught skills separately in isolation with random text. And um, through our curriculum search, we used source resources from DESE, like the Curate, and we also used additional uh, resources like ed reports and a couple of other uh, rubrics from other states as well that have already adopted the science of reading as a belief. And then um, we wanted a curriculum that also provided strong assessments for us. As far as content knowledge, um, when we when selecting curriculum, we wanted to be able to provide our teachers with the training and the actual time needed to become familiar with the curriculum. So in the end, we ended up selecting, this is what we have right now, um, EL education as our primary curriculum. Um, we have foundations in K-1 through third grade and rewards for fourth grade as a continuation. Um, our assessments have changed considerably from years past, our reading assessments in particular. And now we have implemented targeted reading instruction versus what we used to call guided reading. Um, in years to come, we would like to implement the EL all block that would be in the older grades. And then for our lower grades, K1 or K2 to uh, third grade, they would be uh, K2 to second grade, completing the EL skills block. Um, we're also going to be looking at our assessments for next year to make sure they're more closely aligned with what our goals are. As far as um, building up content knowledge, Right now, what we have in practice is a prioritization of daily intellectual preparation by teachers. So we call this DEEP, um, drop everything and plan. It's a time that our teachers get together every single day to go over the next day's lesson. And we have weekly um, DEEP also. Um, in the, and in this planning time, we also include ESL teachers and special ed teachers. Um, we have we use our data and we analyze our data and create action plans. We set aside time to create these action plans um, that we then transfer and use in our targeted reading groups. Uh, our teachers are also getting support from reading specialists offering research driven resources um, to help them in their planning of their small group instruction. In years to come, we would love to be able to provide our whole staff uh, letters training, which is like 
a really comprehensive training that in uh, that dives really deeply into the science of reading, um, and uh, w furthermore, we are going to extend and go deeper into looking at the mass literacy guide the, of each of the language comprehension um, categories. So now that you have a high view of um, how we think about the guide and how it supports our decision making, our approach, um, let's show you all the good stuff that's in, actually in there, uh, which is really the, the meat of this. So the way we're going to show you how we use the guide is by going through the language comprehension piece um, that looks just like this. And so we're just on that blue side over there um, digging into them. And we're going to take you through each component and talk through our process, as well as how we how we took it into practice. So you'll hear us refer to here's the thing on the mass literacy guide, and then also here's what it um, could look like in practice, um, or the way that we're thinking about implementing it based on the fact that we've um, found it on here. So a quick note, which might be obvious, but um, we're going to go through each of these components separately, but all of them, like everything on here, really works together, and we cannot em emphasize that enough. Of course, the all of the um, components of fluent word reading work with language comprehension, but even within language comprehension, all of the um, vocab and morphology, knowledge, syntax and grammar, and th those higher level skills all work together. And so you'll probably hear some overlap, and that's that's a good sign because they overlap. And as we talk through, you'll probably hear bits and pieces of the different components. So we're gonna jump right into vocabulary and morphology. Starting with um, this first resource that I wanted to bring to your attention, which is really honestly just the link to um, the, the morphology and vocabulary link. And if you scroll down, there'll be a section called Promoting Vocabulary and Morphology Development in the Classroom. And we really like this resource because it's pretty straightforward one, but second, anytime that I see uh, a when teaching or in the classroom um, headline, I'm drawn to it. And so this one being when teaching vocabulary, how to support deeper understanding, allow students to, and then giving you those exact um, specific ways to support that deeper understanding. And what I like about this section too, is that it has the deeper understanding strategies right here. And up above really talks about how to get that, just learn the word, learn the word from a simple, um, uh, surface level, talking about orthographic mapping and the importance of that, but then all the way to thinking about different um, meanings of the word, um, correct and incorrect uses of the word to really interact with the word. And again, promoting students understanding of the morphology of language and vocabulary. Um, and just a quick example of that um, before I know, and then I'll go back to the slide is from our curriculum um, is a, a, a the Freyer model, which has the definition of the word, um, students draw a picture of the word, examples, and non-examples. And so those are just basically taking the research-based practices from the Mass Literacy Guide about vocab and morphology and showing you an example of how that can be put into practice. Um, the next is Selecting Vocab, which is a resource that's from the Mass Literacy Guide, and it links you to a resource from um, Achieve the Core. So I'm going to open that up really quick. This one um, is really useful to guide your vocabulary instruction. It has, um, I want to draw our attention to the word part instruction and the connection to home language um, part of it. So down here, what I really liked was the additional support for ELLs. Um, all the different strategies that you can use, word banks, sentence frames, in-depth in vocabulary study. Um, but the two that really stuck out to me is like, oh my gosh, those are ones that like I knew about or learned about in grad school, but were just helpful for me to rethink about. And are these in our curriculum? Are we doing these enough with our um, English language learners and all academic language learners at our school? Um, so specifically that home language connection, and also the word part instruction. And so how morphology, when we're doing word study, bringing that into also when we're reading texts. Um, and then of course, things like cognates um, to help support vocabulary specifically for English language learners. 
So this is an awesome resource, um, again, drawn to this idea of what activity or what thing can I do in the classroom or can teachers do in the classroom? That's where my eyes usually go to. And that's what's really great um, on here. And then the third thing from, um, that I really wanted to call out as a really helpful resource, again, just the strategy, what can I do as an, as an educator, is that there's a video actually on um, in this section. And I wanted to just, you know, make sure that you were drawn to it as well um, to learn about a specific teaching routine for um, the younger grades. And so thinking about how to choose those vocabulary words, teach them um, explicitly, and then of course, build on deeper meaning for students as well. Um, so as, as far as using those things, you know, of course, use that, um, the vocab guide to guide your vocab instruction. And then of course, for the video, like see if your curriculum offers this type of lesson already, because then sometimes it's just helpful to have a video of it. But if not building it in, especially with, um, you know, some of the lessons you might be designing yourself, like a, um, a small group lesson, for example. And then wanted to pull out two more things from this section, the morphology and vocab section, um, two recommended reads. So of course, I, like I said, I'm super drawn to anything that's like in practice, this is what it can look like. But we also know that of course, you know, building our content knowledge is going to always make us better every day for our kids. And so the two readings I really, really, um, you know, I, I've always loved the language, but um, morphology being one of my favorite parts of language, um, this this morphology one piece of the pie um, article. Um, and it made me, I really was interested in it, especially because it was from the International Dyslexia Association um, because of my experience listening to the uh, At A Loss For Words or uh, yeah, podcast um, and making the connection to um, talks about dyslexia. Um, and so reading up about this was really helpful. And again, is on the mass literacy guide. And then the go-to strategies for ELLs. This is another resource that's available on there. Again, just like, okay, what do I do? Great, here's my guide for, um, you know, specific things about vocab and morphology. And so it, it goes into all these different strategies for what to do to support that. Okay, Mandy, oh no, it's me still. <laughs> so the next part, um, we've just talked a little bit about the vocab and morphology part, and now we're going into the knowledge part. So, Again, the Mass Literacy Guide resource, um, we have three that we wanted to call our attention to. So the first is how um, a, a resource from the guide about how to select text. So the link here from Achieve the Core has information about the importance of text sets and then also how to start your own. So the way that you can use this guide, which is awesome, like I love this part where it's um, create your own text sets and then you can literally click through it and it'll help you to create your own um, text sets is that it definitely is a place to start in terms of your own, like start your own text set using the resource. But um, what we did from the information on there about the importance of text sets is kind of cross-check the research with why we chose EL. So EL, for example, our curriculum um, is aligned with this resource. Um, and so we knew that it was research-based. We knew that we could trust it. And that was part of our decision-making. Um, and so just an example from EL is this text set page, which um, EL is an open resource um, curriculum. And so you can access it um, from their website. But this is just an example from first grade. It's a, um, a module on tools and work. And this is the text set that is provided um, as uh, the, the curriculum itself. And so we knew that it was, we were cross-checking it with the importance of text sets. The next thing um, is nurturing an inquiring mind. This is a Reading Rockets article. And so um, just to click it open, so you know what it looks like. Um, so the way we were using things like this, you know, resources, articles, um, and thinking about uh, the importance of nonfiction read-alouds um, 
was in here. And so what you could do is do an inventory of text for each unit. Is there a, a mix of nonfiction and fiction? Um, do you read them aloud? Is that part of your curriculum? If so, yes. If not, consider supplementing and this Reading Rockets resource will help you think about that. And then what we did was look at our curriculum again. Do we have enough mix of fiction and nonfiction? Um, and I think I have an example ready. Oh yes, of a nonfiction read aloud. So this is um, from K kindergarten. They're, they learn about weather. And so this is the nonfiction text that they read. And then this is the read aloud um, lesson about it, asking and answering questions about the text using the text weather, which is a nonfiction text. And then the last part of um, the knowledge piece that I wanted to call our attention to was uh, directly from the guide. So the actual Mass Literacy Guide site, just right on there, is the considerations for students learning English. Because like with any curriculum, of course, sometimes our curriculum, it does have um, suggestions for support for different types of learners. But of course, not every single time is like a perfect, you know, match with what our students need. And so this is a great resource for, you know, cross-checking, do we have enough um, of what we want? And, and learning from all the different ideas for um, supporting knowledge. And now Mandy's gonna kick us off into syntax and grammar. All right, so for syntax and grammar, the section of the mass literacy guidance that I found really helpful, which I was first drawn to was the achieve the core juicy sentence guidance. Um, this is also included in the L education curriculum as what we call a language dive. Um, I personally learned about juicy sentences through my work uh, being ESL teacher, but like, as we know, all of our students are academic English learners. And so this protocol is super awesome for breaking down each word part and really understanding um, these longer complex sentences within um, a text that students are probably listening to in the younger grades. Um, so I just like, it gives a whole breakdown of how to actually choose a sentence, um, what to do with each part of the sentence. And there's like three main parts of like reading the sentence, um, deconstructing it, understanding all of the parts of it, and then reconstructing that sentence with our new meaning and new understanding and putting it in our own words. Um, a second resource from the syntax section of the guide was the this syntax focused kindergarten lesson video. I love this video because um, one, it's super short. I can play it on double speed and <laughs> watch it within two to three minutes. And two is something that I could walk away with and replicate the next day in my lessons and even in my coaching, like I was excited to share it with my team. Um, the, the type of this uh, video is showing uh, nouns and verbs making up sentences and playing with it um which i typically like thought of as like an esl activity but it's so true like the the research on the mass literacy guide it says like syntax and grammar is actually like a strong predictor of comprehension later um in the student's educational career um so this video was cool and something that was cool about it be the k to two k K-2 students aren't really fully developed in their reading development, but this syntax activity can be easily adapted to meet the students where they're at using the short vowel sound and decodable words. Um, moving into the higher level language skills, when we're thinking about our uh, lower elementary students, we don't always think about comprehension because they're not reading text by themselves yet. And so um, one of the things I liked about the guide was the, the section on inferencing from the What Works Clearinghouse. Um, what Works Clearinghouse is a really amazing resource because they actually compile all of the research that is out there and kind of give you a rating about um, 
how strong the evidence is for each of these um, uh, activities, skills. Um, the second uh, skill listed on the, the mass literacy guide that we pulled out was the monitoring comprehension um, skill and the resource, again, I think comes from the What Works Clearinghouse. It's pretty cool because um, it gives you lots of different types of questions to ask students, especially in kindergarten through third grade, who are listening to read alouds. And we know that oral language development is so crucial for later comprehension um, in, the, in the later years. Um, so one of the things that we do in our practice from using this, these kind of resources and it's kind of embedded in our curriculum is um, the co-constructing of anchor charts and the direct instruction model of I do, we do, you do. But of course, none of this uh, would have would be possible. These comprehension type of activities would not be possible without selecting an appropriate text for um, the read aloud. And this resource here is great for helping you to choose a text that would be um, appropriate for these type of activities that are like engaging for students um, and facilitate these types of conversations, discussions. Um, just some examples of the textbooks within our curriculum. You can, I added the Lexile levels here to show that the Lexile levels are indeed like higher than what a student in K2 through second grade would be able to read by themselves. Um, but because they are working on becoming fluent readers and Mass Desi, the Desi Literacy Guidance reminds us that we shouldn't wait until students are fluent word readers to teach comprehension. Um, we can be developing those skills simultaneously. So uh, through teacher-led close read, students are able to develop and practice higher lang level language skills. Um, if you click through, Victoria. So focusing in on the magnificent, most magnificent thing, the focus question for the students as they were reading is how was the girl able to make something so magnificent? And this book is read several times. It's not just a one and done book. Um, and each day they get a little bit deeper in here. This page is the questioning that's asked just about that picture. What do you notice? They have the opportunity to stand up and look and act out how the girl looks. Um, they talk about the word meaning of shocked. Why is this girl shocked? And then um, Later, as they read the book another time, they're co-constructing this anchor chart and um, developing their understanding and their meaning of the book. So just in closing, um, Mandy and I wanna just offer some just guidance or, or advice, I guess, on where to begin our, uh, because there's just a lot on here, of course. Um, First is be a critical consumer of your curriculum, really cross check stuff. Like um, that's what we really found to be helpful. Um, and if it doesn't align with the research, then just consider asking your principal some about um, making a change. The second thing is read the stuff you're drawn to. Um, like I said, I'm drawn to the like, what can we do in the classroom? But small steps, of course, make big changes. Um, and then some of the stuff we highly recommend um, for further reading are um, reading Kilpatrick, um, as well as Shanahan on Literacy, the, the, the blog, and then of course that podcast that we were talking about. So just to um, kind of our final words for today, um, just to bring us back to the simple view of reading, really grounding ourselves fluent word reading times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. We use the last, the mass literacy guide to help us um, build our knowledge, learn about evidence-based practices, and ultimately help us um, to be critical consumers about how we teach reading. And of course, please, please, please spread the word. All set. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Mandy. That was awesome. You certainly gave us all lots to think about when we um, 
are in practice and we're considering ways to approach and use the Mass Literacy Guide. It is time now for us to move forward with some Q&A. So I am going to hand it over to my colleague, Catherine Tarka, and she's going to um, take a couple of questions with Victoria and Mandy. Thanks, Catherine. Victoria, Mandy, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and for just being so open in sharing your journey with us, where you've been, and some of the strategies that you found to work um, for you and with your students. We're really grateful to hear your on the ground perspective. Um, I've got some questions that I captured from the Q&A. Um, we may not get to them all, um, but we, are, uh, we encourage um, attendees to keep submitting their questions. And if we're not able to address them all today, we're more than happy to follow up with people to try to provide answers and information after, afterwards as well. Um, so we'll start with a question about um, instructional strategies that are recommended for English learners, but actually may be beneficial for a range of students. Um, one of the questions that came from an attendee is, um, to what extent are the uh, instructional strategies that are recommended for English learners um, beneficial or helpful for other students that may be um, native English speaking students or other students in your classes? So the way that we think about it um, is that all students are academic language learners. And so when we think about the kinds of language that we're teaching our students, we are definitely thinking about it in a way that reaches all students. And so when we think about the strategies that are listed in those ESL or ELL um, resources, really those um, have in the classroom 100% benefited all students because we really see every kid as a language learner. Um, and so I, and I don't know, Mandy, if you have anything to add, but I would just highly recommend that that is like a go-to thing. Um, teaching vocabulary and those different ways is, is beneficial for every student. Yeah, I would say also that Oral language is so much different than written language and the type of text that we, I mean, type of language that we see written in text. And I think it is very crucial to still like the juicy sentence protocol, especially is so great in breaking down parts of the sentence, like the more complex sentences or the way that uh, we speak, it would not be the same as how that sentence is written in a book. And so it does require stopping and really analyzing each part of the sentence. And uh, another question that just came in that is somewhat related because it's about teacher planning. Um, you both had mentioned earlier um, uh, teacher co-preparation, which at your school you call DEEP, drop everything and plan. Um, can you, uh, maybe starting with Victoria, can you just say a little bit more about what occurs in, in those meetings, how you set them up and what they accomplish for teachers? Sure. So um, we have it every day for 30 minutes minimum. Some teachers choose to, to meet longer, like Mandy, I know, meets with her co-teacher longer, but that's um, different. Uh, so the teachers all get together. They have read the lesson plan already because our theory of practice is not to write the plans as we go, but instead make critical decisions about um, instruction in that co-planning meeting. So Teachers ha come having read the text of whatever they're about to teach, um, the lesson for the day, and go through what are the main um, teaching points of the lesson, what are our, for our purposes, it would be what are the different work times, um, and what is the ultimate goal, the student outcome of that lesson, misconceptions, and how we'll get um, the students there. So it's really a whole team of it's the special educator, ESL teacher, homeroom teachers, um, getting together to really talk through that so that when they get to their lesson, they're really ready to go. There's so many questions coming in and I, I'm regretful that we only have time for one more. Um, I, I wanna ask you the question that's about using the Mass Literacy Guide as a resource in your school. Um, there, it's very extensive. There's an, a lot of information that's potentially overwhelming. Um, one of the reasons we're even having these webinars is to try to create entry points and help people start to find a way to use the guide. Do you have any recommendations for um, folks to bring the guide to their colleagues in a way that's not going to be overwhelming and maybe as a starting point to use the resources? My advice would be whatever the buzzword is at your school, you know, like whether it be um, 
Maybe it's, maybe it's small group reading. Maybe it's, um, oh my gosh, phonics is going terribly right now. Or maybe it's um, that writing is, is really suffering, um, that you go in and find like the one thing that could really fuel a conversation to start. Um, because there, there will be buy-in if people are already talking about that thing at your school. Um, and then like really see what blossoms from there. Um, talk, uh, take time to talk with your colleagues, I think is the headline, but like bring the thing to them that you know will really interest them. That would be my advice. I don't know, Mandy, do you have any advice? I mean, I come more from like the research perspective and I know the researchers and the people who helped um, with the guide, like Tim Shanahan and Louisa Motes. And like, I know that it's backed by these people and I know a lot of the, the resources are like, valid so I kind of start from that sense of like I don't even with uh, Victoria as my principal I anything I bring to her it's like well where's the research and yeah. <laughs> like here it is like it's overwhelming but I think if you click through the guide and I especially like the videos I'm a visual person and the videos are generally quick and easy to what you can like text those to somebody where did you get it oh and the mass literacy guide <laughs> yeah lots of text yeah do some texting <laughs> thank you very much um and I'm going to turn it back over to Donna Thank you, ladies. That was really great. Everyone, thanks for being here again today. We had some great information from Victoria and Mandy. Before we end today's session, two quick reminders. First, be sure to check out this top resources page on the Mass Literacy landing page to know where the videos will be posted. You see the prior ones. Also, the Victoria and Mandy had referenced of, um, podcast by Emily Hanford. We also had her in a mass literacy webinar session and that video is posted on the top resources section. Also, we have a one pager that has been created that also supports you and offers different ways to access the guide. Both of these were included in the resource links that were has been dropped throughout today's session. Please take a few minutes to complete this brief survey so we can be more responsive. The link was just dropped in the chat. Also, you're going to be receiving a survey reminder email with the survey link in it within 24 hours of this session, and you can complete it that way if you would prefer. Please note that confirmation of your attendance at today's session will also be within that email. We appreciate your being here today and special thanks to Victoria and Mandy for sharing. We hope you can all join us next Thursday, March 25th at 3.30 for the session on students experiencing reading difficulties. If you have any further questions or comments, please submit them in the Mass Literacy Contact Us box. A link to that is on the resource doc as well. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much and take care.